Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Rugby League Bat Chat. It has been yet another eventful week in the world of Rugby League and we're covering all bases with our guests this week. Starting with, from Huddersfield Giants, Oliver Roberts, the CEO of Feverson Rovers, David Longo, and the Leeds Rhinos, Captain Lewis Vassell. Everyone, welcome. Uh, Oliver, I'm going to have to come to you first. Um, you probably know what's coming. This Super League relegation race has become a four-horse race and unfortunately the Giants have been dragged into it. Um, mm. What can you tell us about what's going on at the Giants at the minute? It seems like you've gone from that magic weekend victory at, at, uh, against Hull to suddenly being joint bottom. Yeah, we're a bit of a, a bit of a tough one. We're four wins away from being at top, top three, top four, or four losses away from being at bottom. And uh, we've gone the opposite way, really, and struggled. If, if, look, London obviously lost this week. I've asked nearly everyone who's come on if they've been surprised by London. Has everyone been caught out by how how competitive London have been and has dragged everyone else into a yeah, they situation. Just, they, they describe London, they just don't die, they just don't go away. Mm. Um, we played them down there, it was a tough place to go, especially down there on that pitch, mm. a bit too different. And they play well at home, to be fair to them, but we got the win there, so we'd like to think we'd kind of bounce back and carry on from that, but we've had a bit of a up and down. Yeah, Lois, I, I know that it's entertaining for all of us as a player, it must be a, it must be a nightmare when you're involved in that sort of situation. Yeah, I think I think it's really tough, and I think that there's four teams that are trying to find a little bit of consistency. Um, I think you know the four teams in it now. You know that there's more than a couple of clubs under that pressure, under that mm -hmm. pump. So I think it's just going to be interesting to see how they go over the next couple of days. But um, luckily for Leeds, they've got a bit of form with that win against um, Catalan, and hopefully continue mm -hmm. that into the next game against Cast Tigers. Let's talk about Leeds, Dav. It was a big win for them. It's a club that you're very close to with your relationship with Fev. Um, how big a victory was that for them to pick up the win? I think it was huge. I mean, um, I know Richard Agar pretty well as well as a coach and mm -hmm. it would look like he's, he's gone back to basics a little bit with Leeds. You know, they were lacking a, a lot of that in, in that early season and I think Robert Louis and, uh, and Lunt has obviously given him a little bit of guidance and experience around the field, but massive, massive win for Leeds. I mean, it, it's still, they're nowhere near it yet still. You know, there's a lot of mm -hmm. important games to go on. I'm, I'm, I think they've got to go back to London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this year and they've still got to play OKR as well so the, the teams in and around them they've still got to play so yeah it's uh, it's hotting up around that bottom end of the table What do you make of that Rob Lewis move Ollie? Uh, it's good for Leeds very good for Leeds like I said before it's just a bit of someone that knows kind of getting around the park and especially mm -hmm. bringing Lunny back I played with Lunny at Uddersfield and he's a good player yeah. so he'll be a big boost for them but they obviously got rid of Matt Parcell the other way and we saw what Matt Par I mean Kevin Sinfield on Thursday night <laughs> when he was watching Matt Parcell must have been tearing his hair out mustn't he he lets yeah. him go he scores the, the final try gets him out of the match what what do you make about Matt going there because he obviously strengthens another of your rivals yeah um, I rate him as a, as a nine he's good very good but again if, if he want Seward at Leeds and won't fit in the bill or won't play now they wanted they bring someone else that fits the job, Bill, and mm -hmm. he moves on and maybe OKR okay, suited him better than what he did Lunny sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Lois, you're obviously around Leeds quite a bit. What's the atmosphere like at Edley at, at this moment in time? You know, it's good. All the, all the players seem in, in good spirits and I think, you know, it's like what you say, sometimes players and people just need a little bit of a change in environment. Mm -hmm. Matt's a great, great player, but I think, you know, You've got to trust in what what, what Kevin's going to do and, and the moves he's going to make, and mm -hmm. hopefully they're they're the, they're the right ones. But I think that is the kind of character, everything that he does is well is a well thought out process, mm -hmm. and is doing the best for the club. And I think there's been a lot of inconsistency throughout the season for a number of different reasons, which are you know beyond people's control. But um, hopefully, with the moves that they've made, they can get back to basics, like Dav said. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we all know the team that do, does the the simple stuff the best are the ones that will. Um, It'll come out on top, so hopefully that, mm -hmm. that sort of is the key to their um, finding their form in the next couple of games. What do you think about Hull KR? Dav, Tony Smith's gone in, mm. seems to be doing a good job. Fantastic, I thought they played really well on uh, on Thursday night. I, you know, they should have beaten all by more points, really. I mean, I know had a, they had Albert Kelly missing in the game, but I thought, you know, Parcel, Garbert, you know, fantastic players. They've got some, uh, you know, Quinlan at, at full-back now, mm -hmm. it just seems to have added that that speed to the game and uh, is an exciting player. But yeah, I think Ulke are the, uh, you know, they're, they're going to probably go on a bit of a run, in my mm -hmm. opinion. You know, I think it's going to be an exciting game with the play Leeds Rhinos because it's going to be, uh, it's probably one game that we, uh, I've, I've heard it's, it's on Sky Sports, is that game as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one. Which leaves Uddersfield, Ollie. Um, I think everyone saw that as a very, very big game with Wakefield, both teams struggling for form. Yeah. Didn't go your way. What, what happened in that one? Why did it go the way it did? 
And we just killed ourselves, just like the little errors, not doing the, the little stuff right. Ooh, we'd start like house on fire, drown teams, and then play 4-5, they were making little breaks, and we would find ourselves on the back foot. Mm-hmm. And we just constantly, there's always so many tackles you can make in a game, and when you burn yourself out, it doesn't help. What's the mood like in the, the Huddersfield camp? As we said, it wasn't too long ago, we were on this show saying, they'll be going to the playoffs now, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, you're in a position I don't think anyone really expected. So what, no. what's the mood like amongst the boys? It's been tough. Because again, we've found ourselves in the same situation in the past three years mm-hmm. on the bounce. Yeah. But I think the boys have dug deep. We've had, the, we've had a talk basically, and having to pull ourselves together. Mm-hmm. Like I think we need to open our eyes and realise what's actually happening. Yeah. And we're in the same situation again, and we need to pull ourselves out of it. I guess because you are quite a tight knit. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, what, you are playing for each other effectively. The, what, there's no way of hiding from it. Jobs are on the line, aren't they? Basically. Indeed, yeah. Well, mortgages be paid, families, and mm-hmm. in the realistic, it's your job at the end of the day. So we've got to deliver. The, um, that moves on to another point. Uh, people keep bringing up promotion relegation. Should it even exist? But because of situations like this, as a player involved in it, do you do you think promotion relegation's right or or not? I know I'm asking you in uh, a different say, position. I but, wouldn't want it because. Yeah. People are losing their jobs. Yeah. One month you've got a mortgage to pay, the next month you can't afford to pay it. Another, everyone's signed up for the salary caps and there's no room for you to sign anywhere else. Mm-hmm. You're out of a job. Yeah. But on the other hand, a, t- a team has earned the right to come up. Yeah. So it's, it swings in both ways, really. I guess we could talk about league structure all day, but let's not do that. I think we're uh, bored of that over the last year. Lewis, let's move to the top of the league. Yeah. We saw the top two fight out each other and Saints came, came up on top. Can anyone stop them realistically? I don't know. I was reading. I was reading it on um, on on one of the online platforms the other day, and you know, Warrington lost out in that game, and mm-hmm. it, it sounded like a really close game. I didn't. I didn't get to see it, unfortunately. I have to catch up on the highlights, but it sounded like a really close game, and you know, we, we've seen it in years gone by where someone's just absolutely dominating at the top, but mm-hmm. anything can happen come grand final, and I think it's a great, great problem, a great thing for uh, Justin Holbrook to be thinking about. But also, you know, there's teams that fly under the radar and then knock them off top spot. Come. come Grand final, so um, I think they're in great form. I think they've got um, a great core of players playing in their in their pivotal positions. But um, I think that they're going to keep going well in the in the league, and hopefully, wherever it happens for the grand final, it's mm-hmm. a competitive and a tough one. But I'm sure that it's in the back of um, of their coach's mind of how we, they keep them firing all, all the way to the very end. As alluded to, someone can come and knock knock any team off on the big game. But is there anyone capable, Dav, at the minute? Look, ultimately, it'll come down to 80 minutes of rugby league and there's that many conundrums before that event happens that uh, it only takes a couple of injuries to key players and, mm-hmm. you know, even a even a loss of form. You know, it's uh, I'll go back to a game that we played in last week against Barrow down here. You know, we, we, we should have won the game and gone second in the championship and would have been seven on the bounce. But, you know, Barrow came down here and played the perfect game against us and, and, and beat us pretty convincingly. So... You know, it's sport. You know, nothing's guaranteed until you you actually win the trophy at the end. I think we can all say that a couple of years ago with Castleford, they did the the exact same thing in the in the Super League. That you know, the the dominated Super League for the season. Then it came down to 80 minutes against Leeds, and they got beat. So, mm-hmm. yep, they're um, they've got a distraction as well as St Helens. They've got to play a semi final, which you know, I think a lot of people are thinking that that's going to be relatively easy for them. Mm-hmm. But um, knowing Halifax and how they can play. They'll get stuck into to St Helens as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of rugby league to play yet. I think to be fair, Ollie, you're probably in the best position to uh, ask this question because you've played against them and seen all the other teams. How how the Saints compare to every other team in Super League this year? But from what you've experienced throughout your career, see, we say it's like you know, they go like a little dip in the season, don't they? I think they always like fade away at a little point. And this year, they haven't, mm-hmm. they haven't disappeared at all. Uh, they had a little loss at London, didn't they? Which were again a tough place to go and, uh, and down there. But uh, I think they'll they'll keep going since. Are they the best team we've seen in Super League for the past? I don't know, five, six, seven years. You could say that. Wigan have had some good outfits out there as well. Yeah. They've just gelled well and they're playing well together. The back three is fantastic. And Regan Grace and they're, they're all they're playing well together. They're like a well gelled team, and it's taken a couple of years to get where they are now. Mm-hmm. Isn't it crazy that we're we talk about Saints bits and bats, but actually they're like the least important team in the competition because it's everything underneath it. I've never known a season like this. Do, do we like the fact that we're focusing on the bottom or, or not? <laughs> what do we think? I think it's 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 sporting. I mean, we, we like drama, don't we? Mm-hmm. You know, it's um, the underdog stories and and 
you know, I think I think people are looking more so at the relegation, purely the fact that Leeds Leeds are there and in in there, you know, and um, and like we said this season, these are trapdoor. You know, the qualifiers over the last couple of seasons have protected a lot of the Super League teams, mm -hmm. but this year it is a trapdoor. Sunday is going to be removed from Super League, but I, I think it goes without saying. You know, St Helens are a, are a very good team this season, and um, they've been a very good team in Super League since mm -hmm. 1996. You know, St Helens have been there or thereabouts, and they're a fantastic club, and and, and they just keep building. And, and the one thing that I do like about St Helens is that they're bringing these young kids through as well. You know, yeah. there's, you know, I know Aaron Smith got injured the mm -hmm. the other week, but is it? You know, he, he came down here and, and played on loan last season with us, and he's a he's a fantastic player. One that can just step straight into Roby's um, boots and, and fill them pretty pretty easily now, and uh, you know I think St. Helens are Texan beating. Anyone going to disagree with that? <laughs> no, I think I think we were speaking about the the bottom hotting up and everyone yeah. sort of like eyes on that. I think it's just interesting. Everyone I speak to they just go super league. Yeah, it's been funny this year, hasn't it? And mm -hmm. you know it's. It's not great if you're one of them teams in the bottom four, but it's probably great for the competition that it's you know eyes all over. So we are focused on Saints, and they're going to keep up that form. But mm -hmm. what is going to happen at the bottom? It's it's bringing a bit of excitement. Um, but I think, like you say, when when a team clicks, and that's what you you've mentioned yeah. with them keeping that form. When the team clicks and they're all just there, all on form, all playing for each other, it's really really tough to stop. Uh, given we've got Huddersfield Giants play here, I'm assuming no one's going to answer Huddersfield to this question. Who's going to go down then? I've asked this every week, and I ask someone to put the neck on the line, and most people sit on the fence. I, I, I went, I went to watch the game on Friday. I watched the Wakefield Huddersfield game, and um, and Huddersfield didn't play well in that game. And mm. again, Lund London have got that advantage with that home advantage. You know, they they do play that pitch pretty well down there. But again, you know, their team's been um, been snapped up all over the place. I keep hearing the signings coming out of London to other clubs, so that's going to affect them mm -hmm. in some way. Um, and on our, I do think it'll be London that, that finish bottom. I think Huddersfield's got enough quality in that team to um, to get themselves out of it. But um, And I think all KR and Leeds will be fine. So I, I do think it'll be London for me. Yeah, I, I honestly I wouldn't even want to... I don't even really know. I agree with everything that you've said there. Well, I'm going to go a different way. Leeds are going to stay up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing you're just going to say Huddersfield is staying no, up. will be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll move on. Um, I want to start actually on the championship a little bit. Um, and the 1895 Cup, it's been in League Express that there's been some cash incentives for the for the finalists. Is that relative to how successful the competition's been or is it something a bit different? Well, I, I think it's a great competition. You know, we, we we were behind it when it first got talked about at the at the meetings that we go to. Uh, we, we were all behind it, certainly from a Featherstone perspective. I know Bradford and, and Halifax had played weakened teams in their um, their rounds, but that was purely because they were still involved in the Challenge Cup. Um, we didn't play a weakened team. We we played Witness, um, and then we had Sheffield on the plastic pitch a couple of days later, and we had a few players carrying injuries. So we played what we believe was a, a good team, and we got beat by a by a fair score. Mm. I think the competition is fantastic. I think it's again, it's got to evolve. We've got to give. We, we can't just be short sighted. We've got to keep this competition in there because. Like we keep saying, you know, there's there's not enough cups to win in, in rugby league. Mm -hmm. You know, a team like Feathers and a club like Feathers, we're not going to win the Challenge Cup. And, you know, getting to Wembley under a, a competition like the 1895 Cup is, is fantastic. And, you know, a lot of people are mourning that it's going to be after the main event. The, they're playing at Wembley. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not bothered, you know, for me, if I were a player, I wouldn't be bothered if I were playing a day before the event. You yeah, know, yeah, they're yeah. playing at Wembley and... Uh, and obviously, if it is a success this year, it's something to build on, it, and it might become that curtain raiser to the main event. What do you think, Collie? I it... think it's, I think it's brilliant. Like even it's the same day, like a magic weekend. All I hear people talking about the bash, Blackpool bash. They love it. The atmosphere is unreal, and also drawing more fans in to fill the stadium yeah. for the game before or or after. Mm -hmm. I think it's a brilliant idea. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? I, I was at the Battle of York game last week. Terrific game, really entertaining. It's brought some memories for the fans. It's created a, an atmosphere, there's a buzz around Batley for certain, they've never mm. been to Wembley Lewis, I mean, it's mm. what it's all about isn't it, this ticks all the boxes. Yeah, it's, get, it's giving the fans another opportunity as well to follow their team in a competition that's mm. more suited suited to them. Like you say, playing in the Challenge Cup, it's great when they get to, you know, Bradford knocking Leeds out and then going on to the next stage, Halifax now progressing, but um, it, it's more suited to, to their fans probably because they know there's a great opportunity for their, their team at the end of the day to, to win some silverware. And like you say, just filling Wembley, it's 
absolutely amazing opportunity to play at Wembley and hopefully the fans just understand that, that it's such a brilliant day for the players to be able to just walk onto that pitch um, and, and stay in and support both games. I mean, Ollie, you, you've got some former teammates who are in the semi-final and you were saying that they absolutely buzzing already so I mean that sort of sums it all up doesn't it yeah good mate to Tyler Dickinson and he said he literally can't wait so the buzz around the camp especially for that competition has been unreal the build ups for the games so the boys are all revved up for it so it is something the boys like yeah and Dav just to wrap this up you said um, you know Bradford Halifax played weakened teams probably because of logistics and dates but if there's more cash incentives in, I think commission's gone up on tickets from centrally and uh, that they sell themselves, there's some participation fee as well. It's only going to become more appealing to clubs if that's involved, isn't it? Absolutely. But um, I, I still think that the the Wembley side of it is, is a bit that appeals to most clubs. You know, we've got a, we've got a fan base here that still remember the, the 1983 final, but they probably haven't been down to Ferguson to watch a game since that yeah. final happened. And... This is another chance if you get to a final of an 1895 Cup to, to re-engage with those fans that have not been to a, to watch a rugby league game for a while. And um, yeah, the prize money, it's, it, look, it's nice, but it just sometimes fills a bit of a gap. By the time you've paid out winning monies and stuff like that, it, you know, it's, it's just another bit of money for players. So, you know, I still think that, that um, it's, you know, it's all about for players winning trophies, getting to bigger events and, um, and the prize money is secondary to all that. Well, that's the first part of this week's show wrapped up. We'll be back after a short break. You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Welcome back to this week's Rugby League Back Chat. For the break, we were speaking about the 1895 Cup. We're going to change our direction to you, Lois, because you've... Uh, can tell us plenty about the women's Super League, but first and foremost, your own injury. You, uh, you've had an ACL, the dreaded ACL. How, yeah. How's it going? How's the recovery going? Um, I had the dreaded ACL and then added a bit more dread onto it. So, um, quite unlucky. I'm, I'm still ACL deficient, so I had my operation done and then mm -hmm. through a few compl complications, um, had to have the ACL removed. So, I'm still back on the back on the um, on the waiting list to, to get that sorted. It's all about the rehab and making sure I'm in the best position to, to go ahead and have that done. So i um, got an operation next Tuesday, so I'm just ticking off boxes slowly but surely and hopefully um, back on the field next season. You caught my attention when you said you had your ACL removed. So how, how yeah. exactly did that come about? So <laughs> it's, it's a long story. Um, I snapped my ACL in September last year. I had my operation in November and then... 10 weeks down the line, just things weren't quite going smoothly with rehab. So mm -hmm. um, I had a scan and um, it showed that I had got um, osteomyelitis, which is basically a bone infection in my femur. Um, right. So I had to have my ACL um, removed through surgery, um, quite a bit of treatment to sort out everything that was going on inside my knee. Um, took a couple of months um, and then now I'm just back in the gym, getting strong, um, working with the physios at Leeds and having more surgery to, to just get me back back on that pitch but um it's slow but it's a slow process but it's one that you've just got to be patient with and, and bide your time and just keep focusing on the things that I can do and um, hopefully with this next operation I'll get a bit more news and and then have a plan for getting back out on the pitch I think that's like the 800th reason why I wouldn't play rugby league now <laughs> um but it does look the the injuries that, that come with this game I know we speak about it a lot but yeah. it's crazy I the the girls like some of the collisions at the minute, they must be absolutely whacked. Yeah, but I'm missing it at the moment. Yeah, I'm missing it. I'd love to get whacked. No. Um, no, I think it's one of those things, and it? it's um, swings and roundabouts. But mm -hmm. for me, um, the positives and the benefits of rugby league that have given me in, in my life and my career have far outweighed, you know, 
it was it was just one of those injuries and had I just had an ACL injury it'd have been absolutely sweet, it'd have been back playing next month. But mm -hmm. it's the issues that came on the back of that which could have happened to anyone anywhere. It's very, very unlikely and you know, I think there's like less than a one percent chance. But yeah. you know, if it doesn't challenge it, it doesn't change, does it? And the, the benefits far outweigh the negatives, I would definitely say. I'm sure you've been very frustrated because the the growth of the women's super league yeah. this year has been tremendous. Some of the I mean Castleford against some incredible crowds at the minute. Mm -hmm. how, how encouraging has this year been for the growth of the women's super league? Yeah, I, I, obviously gutted at any time to injure yourself, but at the time that I did it, it seems like everything's just growing and growing and growing. So um, that was a shame, but. I'm just happy to be able to promote the game in any other way that I can whilst mm -hmm. I'm off the field. And yeah, you know, each all of the clubs were speaking to Dave earlier. All the clubs are real, really, really buying in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to promote the women's game as much as they can, putting it forward, putting it first, and and really paying attention to it. And we're seeing now with the crowds that people are getting, the online media um, interaction and engagement. It's absolutely massive, and it can only keep growing and keep growing. And you can see that key stakeholders like the RFL are really mm -hmm. putting. Um, like different sort of input to make sure that the game keeps growing ahead of 2021 and Women's Super League has been great so far and I'm sure that, you know, as with the men's, it'll hop, hop up to the back end of the season when we look at playoffs and, and semi-finals this weekend. So that's um, one to keep your eyes, eyes out for. You've seen the effect of this club, Dad. We've been running a, a women's team for for a long time and mm. um, but like you said, it, it's like anything, you know, it, it needs time, it needs investment mm -hmm. and and if, they don't, if the RFL don't allow either of them to uh, to be brought in, then um, then it's going to struggle. But I think what we've seen so far is is certainly a massive improvement in, in the game. The media side to mm. to Women's Super League has been fantastic. And the kind of, you know, really, you know, the, the girls, and I see some of the games, they really embrace Rugby League. And, and you know, I've, I've said it to a lot. I, you know, I, I worked with Lois at Leeds back in the day when uh, when Lois were going out into schools and developing girls' mm. Rugby League. And I've, and I've been part of that myself. And... There's a real appetite for it, so we've just got to make sure that those pathways are, are sound and, and the grassroots is, you know, there's more clubs getting involved with, with women's rugby at a grassroots level, so that development's flowing through, but yeah, it'll only flourish. Well, the, because the participation's flying up, not just yeah. at a professional level, but at, at grassroots and everything, isn't it? I think I think that's the thing, though. If you give girls something to aspire to, then mm -hmm. they'll, they'll be able to. As Dav said, when I were going out in schools maybe sort of four years ago, it were kind of what incentive did I give them? It were like, you know, if you do really well, you can play for your local club and go play for England. And there's yeah. that massive gap, whereas now it's, you know, get involved girls as an opportunity to play for, for Leeds Rhinos women, for Fev, Fev Rovers, or mm -hmm. go play at Fev Lions, who are linked with Feverston Rovers. You can see that, you know, clubs are putting that infrastructure in place for girls to get inspired and have a pathway to travel on, yeah. just like the boys. And that that's a big thing, because the, the, the other sports that they might play kind of you know, blue blue rugby out of the water because, well, actually, if I swim, I can swim for Leeds and I can swim for Yorkshire and I can do yeah. this. We're now kind of seeing that pathway and I think that's a massive incentive for the girls and we'll keep the grassroots growing and that's only great for the top end of the sport. Ollie, I don't know how much of the clips you've seen on social media and that, but, I mean, some of the... Tri that Georgina Roach tried the other week, the chip over that range. <laughs> yeah, the, I've the, seen a few of them. The I wish you'd teach me some stuff. <laughs> the, the quality's... Like, without, without trying to sound patronising, I'm not, but the quality has increased tenfold from what I've seen from maybe in the space of a year. It's, it's really encouraging all of it, isn't it, really? Yeah, massive. And it's brilliant for rugby league in general. Yeah. Men and women playing, it, that's how it should be. It's an inclusive sport, isn't it? I mean, you you know from, from your experience how it, inclusive this game is. Everyone is brought together, isn't it? That's, that's the strength yeah. we've got. It's really. a family sport. And, yeah. and to bring everyone in close together, I think it's really good. What's the next step, then? Where, do, where does it go from here? What, uh, great strides. What's the next stride forward? For me, personally, my, my opinion is that we've got to keep our eyes on 2021 and keep mm -hmm. progressing and developing um, the girls within within the system to, to get the best outcome for there. And, you know, the RFL are doing a great job in the England Performance Unit in keeping those girls in close together. And I think there's some exciting tours planned for the, this year and next year. Um, but for me, we've just got to keep the quality in Super League. So, you know, we see the, the teams like Australia and New Zealand, why they do so well, it's because they have competitive games regularly. So for me, we've just got to build on women's Super League and Origin and make sure that those games are as comp competitive as they can be and that might not mean growing from a, a I don't know how many teams we've got at the minute, 18 competition to 12. I think we've got to keep it um, as competitive as possible so we're mm -hmm. making sure that the games that the women are playing week in, week out um, are really meaningful and, and put out the best product for the fans as well. Is there a fear that we're going to lose some of the top players to Australia? To new I, I thought I'd, I'd seen something somewhere that suggested there could be some 
some players move at some point? I don't know. I think, you know, that happened in, in times gone by. I've you know, got friends who played sort of like eight years ago who went and had a go in Australia. And I think different people have different different thoughts. I know that for me, it'd always be a... I'm quite a home bird and I love England, I love Leeds, so yeah. I'd, I'd kind of... I'd find it quite tough myself personally, mm -hmm. um, but I'd, you'd always consider it. But I don't think so. I think that, especially ahead of 2021, I'd be shocked if I do, because I think there's a lot of opportunities for England to go out there on home soil and, and pull out an amazing performance and, mm -hmm. and win a World Cup in 2021. And I think that it'd be tough to have the contact time with the England performance unit mm -hmm. whilst being over there. So I don't, I maybe don't think before 2021, but maybe 2021, 20, post 2021, that mm -hmm. could be an option. But I don't think it's a negative thing for the game. I think that it could be a two-way attraction of if someone goes over there, someone comes over here. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I'm not I'm not sure of, of how much that will happen, but I think that up until 2021, things might be focused around the World Cup. Have there been any talks about going full-time? No, and I think, um, I think that's the, the ultimate goal and I think that, you know, within within years to come we will get there. But I think we've got to learn to, to, to walk before we can run and I think that we're ticking off so many great milestones at the moment, you know, Women of Steel Awards, um, the way that Super League's going at the minute, the increased media attention. I think that everything is going in the right direction but we've got to be able to tick off all the key parts we need to before we can get to that point. And for mm. me, if we have any paid players, I'd want it to be sustainable um, yeah. and, and and keep going from strength to strength. Long term, what's the sustainability like for, for multi, you know, because you've got wheelchair as well and, and LDRL, PDRL, feasibly, how, how can we get to a position where we can have more than just one full-time team at any one club? Does? Well, again, it'll, it will come down to that investment and that, that only comes through a, no, a number of um, factors. It's, you know, their own broadcast rights to, to be stood, stood alone mm -hmm. under a, um, a broadcast banner or, or, you know, commercial rights coming into the sport. But again, we've got to make sure that we, we, get, we get it right at the, at the very top at this moment in time, you know, Super League and the Championship in the men's game is still struggling. You know, we're, we've still got this cliff edge scenario coming up in 2021 where we've not secured broadcast deals and rights for for, the, for that game. So again, like, like Lois has just said, you know, it's going to be small steps. You know, we've got to make sure that when we do implement something, it, it, it's got that long-term vision behind it. And uh, as a game, I think that's, that's where we need to grow the entire game. We, we've seen, I, I keep referring back to football, but we do see it in football all the time where mm -hmm. You know, there's clubs that have uh, have dropped out of the Premier League. You know, nearly 18 years ago, and they're still receiving parachute payments and stuff like that. They're still being protected. You know, and uh, and that's where we have to be. You know, when all he's talking about, you know, again the the cliff edge scenario end of this season where they could be out of contracts and stuff like that. You know, we've we've got to protect our sport and our players and 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 the old game. You know, it's not just about pumping money into into Super League. It's about protecting the game as a whole. Ollie, just on the international front. You had a tremendous World Cup in 2017 with Ireland. Now you're in the England Knight squad. What's 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 going through your head heading into 21? Uh, I had a bit of phone call with Stu Little, who's Ireland coach at the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to him the other day and stuff. So I have to wait and see what's planned for that. Really, it is strange, isn't it, that you, you can be in that position where you don't really. It's only two years away, isn't it? Yeah. Well, some stuff happened with Ireland after the World Cup. There were yeah. a lot of change at the board and stuff mm -hmm. like that, which. Um, I wouldn't say upset a few people, but left a few people in the unknown. Yeah. Uh, if they want to go over full domestic route, Ireland at one point, they thought they want to go over full domestic team, which for growing sport in Ireland, it'd have been good for them. Mm -hmm. But then progressing, they still haven't actually qualified for the World Cup yet. Um, so they need to do that at the end of this year. I think they've got Italy away, Spain, uh, Spain away, Italy at home, sorry. Yeah. So they need to win them to qualify for the World Cup anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to wait and see. The uh, the England Knights, you met up not about a couple of weeks ago with Wayne yeah, Bennett. Yeah, two weeks ago, what yeah. What can you tell us about that meeting? Oh, it was a good meeting, a good guy. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty fun, to be fair. We had um, a comedian come in, literally there, an hour. Met Wayne, spoke, all the boys got together, gelled. Mm -hmm. um, Knights and first team. Mm -hmm. And just sat in a room, comedian came in and just ripped everyone. When well, you say <laughs> comedian, was he the comedian himself? No, no. <laughs> he, had, uh, he had a few personal <laughs> jokes, to be fair. He got uh, a few boys. Luke Gale was telling me that his hair was brought up. Yeah, yeah, and uh, George Williams got a new set of teeth. He managed to spot <laughs> <Is> them. <he? laughs> right, OK. So Did you yeah, get butchered? Yeah. He, he picked everyone out, he knew what was going on. <laughs> Did you get butchered? No, I stayed away. <laughs> <laughs> how, on a serious note, how, how is that set up? Because it, we, we don't get a lot of insight into how it works, what you do when you're there. How have you found it? Because you're relatively new to it. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be fair. It's literally the boys, you play against the people week in, week out, try to take their heads off and you go there and everyone's best of mates. <laughs> so that's how it should be really. And um, yeah. it's like really well gelled together. And mm -hmm. the, the staff, Paul Anderson's there we're in the night seeing and stuff. And, it's good. Everyone's gelled in well. There's no England this year, Lewis, but there is Great Britain. Now, Wayne Bennett has said, Blake Austin, Jackson, whoever, if they want to play and they put the hand up, they'll do it. Are we okay with that? What, what's your take on it? Give me a tough one there, aren't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. Me, me personally, I don't know, I find it tough because I think that mm -hmm. when you play for England, it's so patriotic and proud and and things like that but I guess it's 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 a, a full buy-in I think for me if, if everyone's okay with it then mm -hmm. we'll go for it and I think if the player that's coming in you know will put everything on the line if they're the type of player that will put everything on the line and they'll play with pride regardless because I think sometimes you're always playing for yourself so although it's about playing for your country you always want to have a good performance not only for the fans you know who you're representing and and and, and your teammates but just for you as a player so if they're the kind of player where you know they've got that accountability I think you know, you can maybe overlook that, but for me, I think there's a few issues to be considered about how much pride and, and patriarchy, patriarchy there is associated with it. Dav? Well, I, I grew up watching Great Britain. You know, I was mm -hmm. one of those kids that got up at four in the morning to watch the test matches, and, um, you know, I think it's a fantastic concept. I mean, if it gives us a better chance to, uh, to beat the Australians or the New Zealanders, then uh, I'm all for it. But uh, I agree with Lois, you know, again, when you're representing England, Ireland, mm -hmm. Scotland, Wales, it's... Uh, it's good to be doing that as well, but yeah, Great Britain, it's uh, it's a thumbs up for me. What about you, Ollie? Because I mean, you, you've got strong Irish family, but you are you were born in England. There's a lot of heritage players that play for Ireland, so you've seen the benefits of it. But as a guy wanting to play for Great Britain, there might be people who come in and potentially take your spot coming from Australia, or whatever. What, what do you think about it? Again, like I say, it's tricky, mm -hmm. but <laughs> at the end of the day, it's if someone's better than you in your position mm -hmm. and they've earned the slot, you can't really kick up a fuss about it at the end of the day it's up to the coach and who picks and who he wants to bring into the team you can't really argue with that Would Blake Austin and Jackson Hastings as an example be shoo-ins? <laughs> Possibly <laughs> I mean um, we had to overlook wouldn't it? It's, uh, Black and Coot as well obviously. Yeah fantastic fantastic players I mean they've uh, I think Blake Austin's still at the, he's at the top of the Man of the Steel yeah. charts yeah. at the moment in time and, uh, and Jackson Hastings has been a standout for Salford um, so yeah well Nothing's a shoe in, but I would say they'd be right up there. I'm not going to ask you all because I think it'd be unfair. You might make some enemies at the next camp if you uh, answer that question. So we'll wrap up the second part there. After the break, we'll speak to Dav about all things Featherstone Rovers along with more rugby league chat. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Rugby League Back Chat. We are at the LD Nutrition Stadium, so I will come to the CEO of Everson Rovers. David, uh, you had a good win at the weekend against Halifax. You've always seemed to win there, don't you? Yeah, well, under my time here, we've played Halifax six times and only lost twice. So, it's um, not bad going. Yeah, we, it was a tough game. I mean, we needed the win. We had a, a poor result the week before. And, um, you know, when it got to 18 all, I must admit, I was a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. I thought Halifax were going to kick on and... Uh, and probably beat us by a point or something like that. We've lost a couple of games this season on a drop goal, and Dane Chisholm attempted three of the worst ever drop goal attempts I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. They, they were terrible. Were. And um, But luckily for us, yeah, we got the win, and um, and we move on now to Lee at home. You've had an incredible season, really. I think before the season started, no one had given you much of a chance because Ryan Carr came in late, he had to recruit late, brought in some overseas players people didn't know a lot about, yet you find yourself joint second. Have you exceeded your own expectations? I think we have. I mean, it, it was a, yeah, you know, it was a dreadful start. Really, our pre-season were, were really poor, and um, Ryan came in and, and kind of did tell us as a, as a club that he'd needed at least ten rounds to 
get us up to something that looked like a team that were going to be competitive in the championship. I never thought for one minute we'd be in the relegation dogfight like some of the fans were were alluding to at the beginning of the season. But um, you know, we've 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 got a tremendous relationship with Leeds Rhinos, and, and we've had a pretty decent one with Huddersfield this season as well. So um, we've had some quality players that have come into our team. Obviously, we recruited our own quality as well in Cameron King and Dane Chisholm and you know the Josh Hardcastles of this world and Connor Careys who have been fantastic for us as, as outside backs. You know we've uh, we're getting to a point now where it's um, we've got two crucial games. We've got Lee at home this Sunday and then we play Toronto away, and then we um, we've got a, a, a block of fixtures where again you know we. We can't we can't be seen to be taking them easy because you know we've been knocked off against Dewsbury and Barrow at home this season and, and arguably four points which we thought we'd would have bagged already but this this championship is is extremely difficult and it's very very tough in in some areas. The um, the thing that impresses me the most about what Ryan's done is how much turnover he had during the season. I saw a start. I think Ryan told me after the game you've had twenty players on loan or on dual reg yet he still managed to get them firing and playing a decent round of rugby. How on earth have you being able to manage that sort of turnover. Yeah, I mean, t- to be honest, the, the spine of the team's been pretty settled. Mm. You know, Cameron King and, and you know, I know Chisholm came in slightly. He came in at the summer battle. No, the Good Friday game. He came in. Um, you know, Ash Golden's played a, a high number of games for us a, as a fullback. So, you know, Luke Briscoe as well. I know, I know the Leeds Rhinos dual reg players, but they've been down here for most of the season. So. <laughs> Is um, like anything. I think rugby league players and, and these two will tell you better than me. You know, we kind of get on with each other. You know, no matter where you come from, it's very since what Ollie said about the international scene. As soon as you get into camp, you become best of mates, and 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 we've got like we said, we've got a very strong relationship with certain certain clubs. And uh, you know, Tom Holmes, for instance, coming on loan to Feverston, he were at Feverston last year, so he knows he knows these surroundings very well. Dale Ferguson came on loan. Is from this area. Dan Smith, you know, another one. So. It's not been as, as tricky as people may think. Mm-hmm. So, but of course, it's uh, it's always better to have a settled team. But it seems to be working for us now. Up until I think before you lost the Barrow game, you'd been made the second favourites to go up behind Toronto. If Featherston were to get promoted this year, look at the smile on his face. <laughs> if if you were to get promoted this year, how ready would you be? Realistically, how equipped would you be to go to Super League? I think first things first, if we had to go to Toronto and win a grand final, Matt Campbell will probably spend all the money in Toronto. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? As a club, we work very hard off the field. You know, we've um, we have got a skeleton workforce. I think most of these clubs in the Championship do have, but the staff that we've got work tirelessly across the week. And you know, we're a club that's quite ambitious, and we we, we trial new things to try to get fans in. You know, we've got a fan zone. We we, we try to create an event type of culture down here at Featherston. Um, but it'll be tricky because it'll be a very short turnaround. And, and again, you know, when you're trying to look for play, you know, we, we're, we're signing players now in terms of signing them for the championship next season. Mm-hmm. However, we've got this one eye on, on a potential promotion. So it will be tricky, but it'd be a nice, um, it'd be a nice problem to have, let's just say that. And mm-hmm. I think for the fans of Featherston, I think the the, the deserve one shot at least to be in Super League for one season if, if that's what it would be you know, you know they've been out of it for nearly 20 odd years now mm-hmm. uh, it's a proud club and, and the, the fans get behind us you know Halifax you saw the, the travelling Travels support numbers, and, and me and yeah. Steve Gill looked at each other and went you know that's a Super League travelling support that you know there were a large number in, in attendance and they, and they get right behind the club mm-hmm. so I think from a club point of view it'd be, it'd be great to get into, into Super League but it, it will carry a lot of problems as well Ollie, we spoke about Super League, we talked about the Women's Super League. The Championship, eh? you can't call it at the minute, and it's, no, it's a good no. comp, isn't it? It is a good competition. Like I said before, the boys are dropping down from Super League, fitting straight in and playing, mm. um, and boys have come up from Championship, fitted straight in the teams and played. So the difference isn't far, really, to be fair, and it is very close. Now you've you've played against a few in the qualifier. I mean, Swinton beat others in the Challenge Cup, didn't they? Not mm. too, uh, sorry yeah, for don't it, remind me about it. <laughs> um, how, from a playing point of view, what what do you consider the gap to be between the the bottom of Super League and the top of Championship? Just, just a, the only thing I can pull different between Super League, I, I think uh, Championship's a bit more physical, but only because it's a bit more slower. Mm-hmm. The play of the ball speeds a little bit more slower, so that gives people a chance to stand, yeah. wind up, and take your head off. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, that's the only only catch really. The yeah. skills exactly the same. You know, like you say you're having Championship teams beating Super League teams off mm-hmm. skill. So there's no difference in that. It's just literally the speed, I'd say. It, 
we talk about uh, Ralph Rimmer was on last week, Lewis, and he, he said we've got to position rugby league in completely differently, and he included the championship being competitive, appealing, so on and so forth. We can't ask for much more at the minute, can we? We've got this playoff race going on where any one of seven could be in. I think there's five that could go down. It's, it's exactly what we want, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's like it's like you say, the, the probably because the game is slowed down a little bit, is a little bit more physical. You, you hear like speaking to people who have like last season when it got to you know the that stage where it's bottom eights and people mm-hmm. playing from Championship Super League. You know, there's there's some some great comparisons, but I think it is just as physical and and it is a, a really skillful game. And the only difference is the amount of time that the Championship teams might actually get to to put into to those skills because they have limited time on the field, whereas. You know, a full-time outfit will be able to take the time over the sessions that they've got. But it is really, I've, I've caught a few games this season in the Championship when we're playing at maybe Bradford Bulls, they do the curtain raiser and stuff like that um, after the women's team, the women's game is a curtain raiser. So you get to watch their games and some really competitive games and it's been good to see some in the Cup as well. It, it just shows that the there is a potential for whoever comes up to, to make the mark on the competition. Is there anyone to stop Toronto though, Ollie? I'm sure you've seen a bit of them on the TV. They, they look... Yeah, they're travelling well, they're travelling well. Again, again, they're a full team out, full time outfit and mm-hmm. they're training every day. Yeah. And they've recruited very well and spent a lot of money. So you'd like to think they would be they are the top contenders and that's why. I'm sure that you'll want them to go up so you get the trip to uh, Toronto. Yeah, it won't be a nice, won't be a bad trip away. Yeah. I'm to get a women's team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very I'm sure well, I'm going this week, so I will make sure to ask David yeah. Agal about that if he's there. You you went and beat them there. To be fair, yeah, we beat him there. Yeah, last the first season. ever team to beat him. Into we was, way. yeah, it was, it was fantastic, and you know, we we played really well. We got we got in the faces, and like we said earlier in the show, it, it will ultimately come down to eighty minutes of rugby league. So, yeah. you know, all we can say as a club is we'd we'd love to be given that opportunity to be eighty minutes away from from beating whoever it is in the grand final. Mm-hmm. But logistically, you know, we've we've kind of like you do now. You start working out the placings, and yeah. you know, there's a potential for a club like Featherston to have to go to Toronto twice in three weeks. You know, and, and logistically for a part-time club, that's that's another conundrum that you have to mm-hmm. factor in. But um, they are beatable. You know, there's there's been teams this season, championship teams this season, that have got stuck into Toronto, and they'll and they'll tell you themselves. Everybody treats it like their cup final. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because a little birdie told me yesterday that the championship clubs are now talking about it not being the highest placed, so Toronto wouldn't necessarily play all of their games. Yeah in Toronto if they finish top, but there were some talks going on. Now, if anyone's in a position to tell us about that, it'll be yourself. So what can you tell us about how those talks have, have been going, how, how it's going to work? Well, I'm not, I'm not aware of them at this moment in time. Right, okay. uh, we've got a meeting next week where I'm sure that'll be brought up mm-hmm. at the, the, the uh, Championship and League One meeting. But for, for me, we've, we've said it before, and I think I said it on this show earlier on in the year, that um, for me, the grand final should be played at a neutral venue anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think it ultimately should be at, uh, at the winner of that elimination final uh, stage, it should be a neutral venue. That's what we're doing in Super League, I suppose. Yeah, that's right, we'll exactly. So, um, and obviously that would take away an advantage from Toronto, but crowd-wise and everything else, I guess that's part of it as well. If, if hypothetically you played at Headingley, you'd get a bigger crowd than you would in Toronto. Is the yeah, I, I think there's a crowd element, but like I said, it's that logistical stuff as well. Mm-hmm. You know, twice in three weeks to go to Toronto, it's a... It's an hard place to go, you know. We we're, we're doing it now for next week, and you know we're still on with sorting visas out, you mm-hmm. know. And um, although most of the teams got got clearance, there's still a few players that we need to uh, resolve. And and it just like we said, when we've got other jobs to be doing at Featherstone Rovers, it, it does become a nightmare. So, but I will say that if we can get to 80 minutes away from rugby league, we'll have a good dig at it. Now you mentioned earlier the crowds. Uh, you travelled fantastically well to Halifax, but there there have been some negatives as well with, with the fans at Featherstone. I know you've been warned and fined and, and what Nelson statement went out on Monday saying you're investigating some comments that have been made. Just sort of enlighten us as to the damage and the repercussions that the club is facing at the minute because of some of the actions of the fans. Yeah, we, we've got a very small number of fans. That are, and, well, they're not fans. Of, I call them people because they're, they're, not, they're not fans of the club. They're not season ticket holders. They've just... For whatever reason, this season they've they've started to come down to stadiums and and make a bit of noise and you know they've been they've been drinking and it's fuel, I would say it's fueled by drink and, and more so fueled by ignorance as well that mm-hmm. that these people just think that they um, they can say or do what they want in stadiums well they can't and and as a club we're continually trying to 
eradicate the problem, but it's very it's very hard. You know, we've not got the uh, the resources like some stadiums have got, where they've got CCTV and you can pinpoint who's chanting, who's doing this. You're kind of listening to people fur down. So, you know, we we got the fine against Rochdale, and we it was a bit of a slap on the on the wrist was that one. But then the the one at Bradford, which again, you know, to put on record, you know, as a club, we have zero tolerance to this type of behaviour. Um, the, the racial connotation that was that was chanted is, is by no means fit for any sport, and then certainly as a, you know, Ollie mentioned, you know, we're a family sport, and we have to embrace that. And, and, and as a club, we are working tirelessly to try to sort this out. Um, we will be putting out today that there'll be free fans that are banned from what they'd put on social media after the Halifax game, which again just just is disgusting and embarrasses us as a club. Mm -hmm. um, I, what's probably hurt me more is is some of the, the further comments on social media where they've they've alluded to Feverston as a club. You know, they're referring to us, you know, and, and, and the kind of basket in everybody at this club, and it's not right. You know, it's mm -hmm. we've got some fantastic supporters down here that support the club for a long, long time. So just because a, sm a very small minority of the uh, people that have come in and, and disgrace themselves, I just want to say that you know that's not the. Um, the, the club, the club that we that we are, you know, we're a fantastic family club, proud history, and we and we do want fans to come down here and have a good time. Well, you like you obviously mentioned the the reputation, the damage it does to the reputation of the club is one thing, but the fines, I mean, ten grand's nothing to be sniffed at. That that for some players in this competition is a player for the year. So what That's what right. damage are these fines doing to the club and, and your aspirations? Well, we've we've just not factored the fines in. Mm -hmm. You don't do in a budget, so. You know, whereas we've we know our you know we've been a, a team that's been trying our damnedest to get into the top fours and, and get into the qualifiers. The biggest challenge for a part-time club at the end of the season, because it's a challenge for all the full-time clubs, is mm -hmm. how fit you are at the end of the season and what we want to be doing this year. Because we know that our team starts to break down. You know, you, you probably saw it, Matt, on Sunday that we had Chisholm go down, Kingy goes down yeah, injured. Yeah, yeah. You know, players are getting injured and. So we're looking around now to try to bring in a couple of players to reinforce our mm -hmm. top five ambitions. It's impacted massively on that. You know that mm -hmm. ten grand that, that we've been fined. It's it's the money's gone. You know, so we're we're going to have to try to find it another way. Or, like I've said on uh, on a statement, you know, it, it will affect us going into the top five. Ollie, I I can never get made around this like abuse that, that comes from the stands. It's not just at Fev this happens everywhere. I mean, have you been the subject of that? I'm sure that you've heard stuff at. at oh, I've heard some, some mental stuff at games before. Luckily, mm. and I don't. Yeah, mm. might have some at some, but <laughs> no, especially kickers. Um, I were injured at one game. Brought Corn on for one at kickers, and the amount of abuse. I could have been bruffy actually. I think the amount of abuse he received just before we were taking his kick were unnatural. Um, so it does happen, but it's it, one of them things. But it must put you off as a player, it, you know, your own fans as well at times, you hear stories that they, they can say some not very nice things after games. It must, as a player, it must impact you as well. I, I, what I'm trying to say, I don't see any positives that come out of... No, the there abuse. is no positives behind it. Again, it, it upsets a player. It's mm. something back in your mind, if you've had a bad game and had a loss, then to have that, your own fans having a go at you on top of you, it doesn't don't sit well. Lewis, I've got to say, the Women's Super League games I've been to, I've, I've not heard anything. It's, it seems a very, very different atmosphere. I guess there is a fear that it will creep in eventually, though, isn't there? I guess, yeah, it's, it's natural. It's like as anything gets bigger, you'll attract more people and sometimes mm. you might attract the, the good people and sometimes you might, unfortunately, attract people mm. who might have a negative impact. Luckily, we're not at that stage now. I think you see a bit of it creeping online and, and stuff like that and I've read comments that have been associated either to me or other players and... It is pretty negative. It's not got any positive impact on that person or mm -hmm. the club or the sport. But I think that as players and as, as people, we're all sick skinned enough to realise that mm -hmm. you've just got to rise above it, haven't you? But for the image of the sport, it's, it's, not, it's not doing anyone any no, favours, is it? Definitely not. So, it's not. We just need people to be positive and embrace all the good that's happening and the good people that we've got involved in the game. How do we eradicate it? Can you eradicate it? Not really. I it's a tough one because it happens in every sport. Look at football, they're one of the biggest sports in the world. and. It's there, it's the, and it's in every spot. Mm -hmm. So I think it comes with. I think you, you've just got to look at doing the right things, and by talking to Dav about the processes that Featherstone are going through at the moment, you know, you, we've got the great people involved in the clubs that will make sure that the issue is dealt with and and 
try to be eradicated as much as it can. But like you say, there's always going to be elements involved. Indeed. We're going to have to wrap it up there because we have run out of time. A big thanks to my guests this week, Ollie, Lois and Dav. We'll be back for another edition of Rugby League Back Chat next week. But for now, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>